My family first came up to this area the summer of 1923. In 1907, Peter Brown bought 71 acres, including this parcel that the cottage is on, so it would have been a much bigger area, uh, for $35.50. This cottage property was severed off what Peter Brown had bought and it was sold to a Darcy Campbell Higgins for $100. My granddad um, was part of a card playing group in Oshawa. He and uh, an Eric Peterson and a Ruben Millichamp were part of this card playing group and they all decided to, I guess, check out some of the real estate that they, I think, saw probably in the newspaper. My grandfather bought the Millichamp parcel for $10,000 and put my Uncle David's name on that, that parcel. The building we're sitting in was built in 1936 by my, uh, my grandparents and uh, actually they first cottaged here in 1937. The original cottage that uh, my grandparents built was uh, just down the road from us and no longer exists. It was uh, built in 1923 and they cottaged there in 1924. They uh, had gone to Big Win and uh, apparently uh, uh, had an opportunity to be, be out on a launch or a steamship uh, ride up and down the shore and uh, inquired of, about the availability of this piece of property which was uh, at the time filled with uh, logs that had escaped from the uh, log booms and stuff that were being transported between the, uh, the upper part of the lake and down to the mills in, in Baysville. So they made arrangements to meet a, a Mr. Bailey who uh, was a farmer just down the road who owned the property and uh, my grandfather being a lawyer uh, drew up a crude contract and and uh, they arrived at, uh, at a figure, and I believe it was something on the order of a dollar a front foot. Well, the earliest um, thing that struck me about the boathouse, when my parents bought it, I was about five years old, and uh, the first thing that I thought was so wonderful was the bridge going across to the main part of the boathouse. And when you walked all the way down that hall, there was a wonderful veranda. This building is 13 logs tall, and 13 was a, uh, a sentimental and almost superstitious uh, number in my, in my grandmother's history. Uh, they cottaged at the, uh, the original place in 1924. 13 years later, in 1937, they had moved into uh, this place. In 1950, 13 years after that, they broke ground for the uh, little log cabin next door. In 1963, 13 years after that, they built the addition, uh, which uh, is the next room over and the, and the master bedroom off that wing. And, uh, and so it went, and as, uh, as my grandmother describes in her book, which uh, is, uh, little 57 page tome which is had been in uh, two editions and sold uh, some 1500 copies hereabouts the number 13 was uh, uh, something that uh, uh, coincidentally just uh, worked out to be her lucky number uh, in her declining years she realized uh, uh, on the odometer coming up from uh, Niagara Falls that uh, the, the trip ended up being 213 miles. So uh, once again, she, uh, uh, she felt that that confirmed that uh, in her mind, uh, her address up here was number 13, Lake of Bays. This cottage is a prefab building. It was purchased uh, from the Aladdin Company in Michigan, I think Detroit. So they moved the walls, the doors, the roof, the floor, everything up. They put it together and they hired a local mason to do the fireplace and the chimneys. And there was a big cook stove, wood cook stove in the kitchen. But it also had a Delco plant. 
which my mother described as being the electricity in the cottage. And I think they had lamps on the walls that this electricity generated lights. And they also had a pump house, like there was the cottage, the shed in the back, which is still there, it's a cabin. There was an ice house in the middle of the pump house where they kept ice and then the pump house would have worked that hydro electricity system and they had running water and an indoor toilet, septic bed. Um, it, was, it was quite modern for its day. I think that my granddad was really looking for a summer place for the kids and he would bring them up and they would um, bring a cook and a governess to look after the children. My parents had kind of major parties, um, maybe two a year, one in July and one in August. And some of them were up there at, at the boathouse, actually. And some were down here on, on the cabin property where the, we had a great big fireplace. And they would bring a, a cook down to um, from the other cottage to cook one of these enormous pieces of meat and they'd have kind of a barbecue evening party down here on the cabin property with uh, Chinese lanterns. And they, there was music from somewhere, I, I guess maybe just a radio in, the, in that era, I don't know. And um, it, there were always people coming and going, friends of my siblings, the older ones down there. And there was a lot of uh, um, connection in those days with the people at the Big One Hotel, which was booming during that era. And uh, we would uh, be friendly with people who would come back every year, people from the States usually that we had gotten to know. I have my mother's diary from uh, when she was 17, from 1930. Uh, my mother was 10 when, they, when she first came to the cottage, and my Aunt Jenny was 8, and my Uncle David was 6. They were driving on the roads as they were back then, probably seven or eight hours to get from Oshawa to the cottage. And they would travel by boat over to Big One to many dances and to into Baysville and into Dorset and, and over to Glenmount as well. And uh, they walked down, I guess, with a pail and got milk from the farm at the White's uh, property. The history of the lake was uh, uh, something that I'm very respectful and, uh, and appreciative of uh, in terms of the chronology of uh, the settlement of this part of the world which uh, uh, only transpired in, in, uh, after the Land Grant Act of 1868. Farming hereabouts was uh, terrifically hard. Two-thirds of the population of the entire region of Muskoka moved on. They abandoned Muskoka. They got on the train and left their homesteads and went to Manitoba and Saskatchewan. People who made it through that era only got by by subsistence farming and by uh, logging during the winter under the auspices of some of the uh, uh, logging companies that had come through this area. and. Uh, and further uh, uh, proceeded uh, to log up through Algonquin Park and, the, uh, and by fishing and guiding uh, for the uh, very venturesome uh, uh, early uh, hunters and fishermen who came up from uh, the northern United States and, uh, and uh, from southern Ontario uh, as basically adventurers. People such as my grandparents, who arrived in the 1920s, uh, attracted by uh, the Big One Resort, and uh, which, uh, in short order, became world famous as a tourist destination. Well, way back during the war, uh, Princess Juliana of Holland spent at least one month, if not two, in the, uh, they took all the stone cottages, I think, that summer. One was for her retinue, I suppose, and or part of the um, P-51 
people who helped her with the children, and then they had the other two closest to uh, to uh, to Big One. And a friend of mine, Kay Truscott, uh, and I thought it would be loads of fun to insert our little teenage selves into her her um, area there. And we and we thought, how and how could we do it? How could we get over there and talk to her? And then we tell everybody that we talked to a princess and we met her children and. And, and well, of course, we didn't think we could do it at all, but we did take the canoe one day and we paddled over there. We could see them on the beach. She was with her children and they were making little sandcastles and putting little Dutch flags in the sandcastles. Anyhow, we very obnoxiously pretended that we were lost. Now, how could you be lost? Really, Big One Island is pretty easy to find. Anyhow, we told this very lovely lady, uh, Princess Juliana, that we, we were confused and, and could we just stop a minute on her beach and sort of get our bearings? And she was lovely. She invited us to come up and meet her children, all three of them, <laughs> and we did. And uh, we talked to her for about an hour and we went home just feeling like a million dollars that we had done it. We had talked to royalty. I remember learning to swim here and there's a, a lovely beach at the front and we all spent hours in the lake. And my father and my uncle were fish and they'd cook the fish or steaks on the, the old charcoal type uh, barbecues that they had in the 50s. My grandparents were very good friends with Ethel and Alex Black, and they had cocktail parties, and they played lots of bridge. Dancing, boating, swimming, bridge. Big one being such a hub, really, of activity, which it was when we were growing up, and that was wonderful for us. You know, we had friends, we had dances, we had the entertainment, well, the tennis and croquet. Many of these people who came up, particularly from uh, northeastern United States, lived in areas like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Erie, Pennsylvania, Toledo, Ohio, Niagara Falls, Buffalo. Lake of Bays and Muskoka generally became a tradition among a, a lot of uh, families. I remember there was a Mr. Heaney from Baysville that used to bring chickens out, fresh chickens. That cedar tree was planted on my birthday in 1948. That's a fixture that I would expect to be respected and not, uh, uh, not remo removed to enhance the view, so to speak. In 1950, that my father decided to sell that property, and we were so upset that those of us who were still in love, you know, with the whole thing here, he, we made such a fuss that he kept the log cabin, which is where we are now. And then it's been a wonderful thing for us to have because it's so much easier to take care of than the other place would have been. And we have the same sights and sounds and everything here. It was always just a very social place. Everyone was welcome and a lot of people have come up here to visit and have really enjoyed the view and the area beach and, and so on. It's, um, we can thank my granddad. <laughs>